Hi, uh, today I want to tell you why I believe that black lives matter most, particularly in this day. So I want to encourage you, ask you to uh, put on your seatbelt because we're in for a wild ride. And we're in for a wild ride because God has been surfacing more things over the last decade than we can process right now. These are intense days, and I want you to know that I didn't really want to do this message. The, the reason I didn't want to do it is I don't like the judgmental atmosphere that's out there right now. I don't like, it, it all feels toxic. I also am not trying to develop a voice out there. Um, really what I'm after is my own mission. See, my name is Tom Griffith and I'm from Greater Formation and my mission is to help people get clear, get focused, and be fruitful. I want to raise up leaders that are rooted and established that are ready for the next decade. I want to raise them up all over the world. But this morning, I felt like God was really impressing on my heart some things to share, and I, I just so much didn't want to do it. And then later, I got a text from somebody out of the blue that said, I, I feel like God might have you share some things in social media uh, from a spiritual perspective that it might be very important. And I took that as a confirmation, but I, I come in kicking and screaming. It's a confirmation that I was not looking for because I'm after the mission that I'm trying to do with greater formation. Uh, the question is, why do black lives matter so much now? Well, it's not really very complicated. Blacks have been mistreated, beaten, discarded, dismissed, negated, killed, locked out, bypassed, not recently, but for centuries in our country. They've been oppressed, they are being oppressed now. This is not how the kingdom of God works. This is not how really... Uh, we believe our country is supposed to work. See, where a the wound, the sickness has not been addressed, it's not been healed, it's been festering for forever. Um, it God is surfacing now and inviting us to pay attention. Can you? Will you join in? I'm going to be rambling a little bit because I really did just want to get this message out. So if you're, if you're with what I'm saying, again, put on your helmets because I, I do have some things to say. What's going to be needed is, uh, from my perspective, is for us to be like image bearers. What we've been put on the earth to do. First, we need, you know, God revealed himself as the God who sees and the God who hears and the God who loves and so we as humans, as bearers of the image of God, need to be people who see each other, to see injustices, but also actually have the ability to see each other and to hear. That means we're going to have to listen. We have to see things that make us uncomfortable. We have to listen to thoughts that may be challenging, and we have to care even though it feels threatening, even though we feel like we're being blamed, no matter what side of whatever argument you're on. We have to see, we have to hear, we have to care, and we have to pay attention. I've been over the last year just really thinking about how interesting that phrase is, that we pay attention. It costs us to give other people our attention. Will you give people who are not like you your attention, will you see them? Actually listen to hear? Will you care for them even though you don't well know them yet? And will you pay attention? I'm speaking primarily to white people right now, but it's true for all of us. See, what we're going to need to do is first face ourselves. We all have implicit racial bias. We all have uh, individual aspects of racism within us. We do. And so you're going to need to face that. You could deny it, but there is no healing for your soul if you deny your own racial bias. Secondly, we're going to have to develop relationships 
mutual relationships across all kinds of lines? Are you willing to develop relationships with people who right now feel distant from you, who feel like they don't like the same things as you. They might not look like they have the same values. Are you willing to press in and develop relationships outside of your cloistered safe circle? It's gonna take, it would take work, but that's part of what's involved if we want to break the power of racism in our country. Thirdly, we're going to need to look at uh, institutional things, the reality of uh, how things are structured in a way that white people are on top and particularly white men like me have been given power. Are we willing to pay attention when we walk into institutions, when we look at the way they're represented, what, the way that they're governed, the way that they're structured? Because they are structured in an oppressive way. It has historically been true and it is true in most significant institutions in our country at this point. And lastly, can we go further and become aware of the systemic issue that it's just actually everywhere, that everywhere is permeated with racial bias, racial oppression, control, and leadership. These are difficult things to face, that we live in a world that's driven, or in our culture, driven by white people. Now it's complicated, it's not easy to ferret out, but what I can tell you is that this is not where God is going. This is not what he's knocking at the door for us to continue as we have been. He's calling for change, and I want to encourage you, this is only the very beginning. This is a long haul issue. It's a big deal. It's not just a cops and young black men issue. It's an issue that has taken centuries to build. It is nasty. Those are just nasty symptoms of something that's been uh, so uh, replicated and so uh, exercised in so many ways, numberless ways of oppression, micro offenses and macro offenses, public and private. This is not going to blow over and be healed. In, uh, in the scriptures it talks about in Jeremiah that the, the, the prophets, that, that a number of people were saying peace, peace, when there wasn't peace. That we try to pa bypass what we need to face. This is one of those days. There's no quick peace. There is no quick answer to hundreds of years of deep oppression on a personal, on a corporate, on a systemic level. Those four levels of racism from uh, personal to uh, relational to uh, institutional to systemic. Those take a long time to undo, to recognize, to face, to go deep. See, there's a huge surfacing of injustices in our country that's been going on over the last 10 years. This is one of them, the, the Me Too movement and sexuality and how men all over the world have been oppressing women forever. That's a big one, that's a huge one. And that Me Too movement, that actually started in 2006, but it didn't get public steam until around 2017. But we've seen financial inequality surfaced, we've seen uh, health inequities surfaced, and now this racial piece is being surfaced and it's time to really address all of them. But in our nation, this is a big one. This may be the big one because of our own unique history. Our black and white racism is nasty and deep. If we can honestly face it, however, if we can go through the massive, visceral, personal, and corporate pain and lament that it will take to actually address it, you can't get there by mental or uh, intellectual ascent. It has to go down in to the degree that it rocks your very soul for you to ever be able to repent, meaning to turn the direction of your heart, your relationships, your view of institutions, and be able to see how things are systemically interwoven. If we can do that and face that kind of depth and that pain and that lament, and we can walk through it towards meaningful change, I believe and I want to hold out before you, this will open a kind of healing for the nations because all nations have aspects of racism in it. 
but it's a painful thing to open up. And I believe it's part of the call in our nation at this time, though it's going to take a long time. This requires the miraculous help of God. It's going to take God's intervention and help. See, we're going to have to see. We're going to have to hear. We're going to have to care. We're going to have to pay attention. And we're going to have to move into some deeper things. We're going to have to move into repentance and change of behavior. We're going to have to, I don't see any way around, a kind of a redemptive reparation. There needs to be pay. Things need to be justified. In that, and it needs to be done in a repent in a uh, uh, redemptive way, in a way that actually lifts and helps and benefits. It's going to take a kind of reconciliation like we have never seen before. Beyond like r restoration, we can't even go to restoration because right relationship has not existed. There hasn't been racial justice in the United States. In, in its history. It hasn't, so we can't be restored. We need to press into new days which are going to involve reconciliation. And what does that reconciliation look like? Well, first, it, here are some kind of just phrases that I jotted. It means, I want to responsibly walk with you. See, we can't be reconciled if I am not willing to take responsibility. Both people do. Any reconciled relationship requires being responsible, walking together responsibly. In Amos it says, can two walk together unless they're agreed, unless they're at a place where they're both willing to accept responsibility? Secondly, but again, I'm talking to predominantly to white people. You're going to need, we're going to need, I need to walk responsibly. Secondly, that responsible walking is going to be for your good, for your benefit, for your flourishing. So as white brothers and sisters, we will need to walk responsibly for the benefit of black culture and black households and black institutions and black individuals that they would it would be for their good, their benefit, and their flourishing. What do I mean by that? I mean spiritually, that they would be in a right place of forgiveness in their own souls, that they be free from bondages of what has been done to them and what, how they have responded possibly uh, wrongly and sinfully to, that they would flourish spiritually and they would flourish emotionally. How It would require God to heal the emotion of African-American culture in our country. We want them to flourish spiritually and emotionally and socially, that they wouldn't have to be afraid on the streets, that they wouldn't have to be afraid walking into a store because somebody's looking over their shoulder, that they wouldn't have to be afraid when they apply to rent an apartment, that they wouldn't have to be afraid to uh, ask for a loan to buy a car, that socially that fear would be ripped off of them and that they could stand up into who they are, that it would be for their good, their benefit, their flourishing, and physically, that they would receive health care, that they would be cared for, supported, and strengthened physically. Can we walk together with people of color if we are not agreed to do so? No, but we have to be the first to lay down our place of privilege. So that kind of reconciliation requires a faithfulness on our part. A faithfulness means not, not ethereal faithfulness to God, that's part of it, but what I mean is trustworthiness. No one can trust you unless you are trustworthy. We can't ask someone to trust us if we are not living in a trustworthy way. So we need to be faithful and trustworthy. Secondly, we need to be a people who trust. And that means that we will trust others who are different from us. We will honor them, though there's 
question in our heart, but because I trust you, I will honor you even though your perspective is a little bit different than mine or massively different because I want to walk towards you and I want to walk with you. So I'm not just going to be trustworthy. I'm going to be someone who trusts you as best as I can that we would, from that place, be able to walk in a mutuality, that we're both players, that it's not a patronizing way of somebody reaching down. No, it's reaching across the aisle, across the house, across the street, across the table, in an equal kind of a way that would produce an equity in how we operate in our small relationships, in our sphere of relationships, in our community, and even in our nation and that it would take a kind of perseverance that is not for a month or a year or even a decade it requires a perseverance that doesn't end see racial reconciliation is just part of the fallenness of humanity and we walk in it to blessed for each other's good for each other's benefit and for each other's flourishing it is an unending work it doesn't have to be heavy and oppressive it's good news because each culture releases a deposit of god's image in a great way but we can't receive it if we don't press in to this kind of reconciliation where does it happen Well, first it happens in you. Again, facing those kind of biases, your suspicions, facing it, recognizing it. What does it mean? Where does it come from? How am I going to release it? Recognizing how your glances, how your language, how your posture may have affected others. So first it's within you. Secondly, it's in your spheres and your relationships. And it's in your locale, your neighborhood, your part of the city, and it's in our nation. So I share all this to say that there's short-term, there's mid-range, and there's long-term application to what's going on. It isn't just to get over the tension in our country right now. Please don't miss this. This is about your life. This is about the life of your children. This is about the generation. We'll be handing uh, this government over to another generation. Don't we want to gain ground? Don't we want to see it healed? Don't we want to see the kingdom of God coming in such a way that we're able to receive the deposits from different people? We're able to receive and give love in a kind of reconciled way. So I feel like God's knocking at the door and asking, are are you in to this thing? Can you receive the conviction that's only beginning to come now? Are you willing to take the pain? of what racial reconciliation looks like. You know, when I was in the 90s pastoring in Boston, we had a lot of racial reconciliation meetings and we'd do identificational repentance and I'd pray and repent. But you know what? It takes a lot more than just praying. It takes praying and it takes understanding and it takes pressing in past easy understanding. And it requires forgiveness and it requires new kinds of relationships and again new kinds of structuring of society that's what racial reconciliation really looks like we're just tipping the iceberg right now so what's my call to you first of all are you willing to receive conviction for ways that you have complicitly participated in racism Are you willing to receive conviction from God for the ways that you might right now be trapped in racism that are blind spots for you that I promise you have? There's nobody who doesn't have it. And those who think most confidently that you don't are actually the ones who are often most bound. Are you willing to receive conviction from God? I'm not saying from anybody else. Secondly, Will you choose humility in this day and not be a finger pointer or a blame shifter, but instead walk humbly and listen? Be like God in that you see, that you hear, that you care. Choose humility to learn new ways because you need to. It's for your good as well as other people's good. And thirdly, I want to encourage you If this is making sense, if you can hear what God's saying in our nation just in this piece, all those other pieces are real too, but in this piece, if you can hear it, are you willing to do the preparation you need in 2020 for the decade? 
See, at the beginning of the year, I was seeing that this would be the roaring 20s again, that there was shaking. God's shaking everything that can be shaken. I kind of mentioned that. Again, these are big things being shaken, but we're receiving a kingdom that can't be shaken. The things of God and the image of God and what we're supposed to relate like to each other, those are things that can't be shaken. If we're receiving that, we worship God with thanks and with awe because He's a God of justice and He's a consuming fire and He consumes the things that are unjust. So that's what's going to be going down as part of what's happening over the 2020s. But are you willing to give your life to laying a foundation like I described my mission for greater formation is to lay, to lay a foundation of clarity and justice and faithfulness and alignment in your life so that you can walk with perseverance through a decade of these kinds of transitions into a place that possibly releases far more benefit to far more people, far more flourishing. So again, are you willing to face your stuff? Are you willing to walk in humility? And are you willing to lay a foundation for a different way of living for the 2020s? Anyway, that's a message I was hesitant to bring. I hope it's of some value for, to you. Please don't snipe me about it. If you do, you do. But uh, if you're hearing a call, I'd love to hear that like that was of some benefit to you because this one was one that uh, took far more out of me than I was planning. Have a uh, may you ponder the things that I'm saying and apply them. And would you be one who is a benefit to others?